today we are going to discuss about the things that happened during the exile of Dr. Jose Rizal in Dapitan. Rizal left Manila sailing on steamer Cebu through the islands of Mindoro and Panay until 7 o'clock in the evening of July 17, 1892. He reached Dapitan, a remote town in Mindanao which was under the missionary jurisdiction of the Jesuits. And this town became a solitary witness since July 31, 1896. During this time, it was considered one of the most fruitful periods with varied, varied achievements in Rizal's life. His stay in this town was more than a life of an exile. It was because it was the period when Rizal had more focused on serving the people and the society through his civic works, medical practices, land development, and promotion of education. It was also the period when Rizal found somehow his brief interlude of peace and freedom. Rizal lived at the residence of Captain Carcinero during the early part of his exile life. Now, Captain Carcinero is a political military governor of the district. He, uh, Rizal, lived at his residence because he did not agree with the condition laid to him by fa Father Pablo Pastels. Father Pablo is a superior of the Jesuit parish priest of the Pitan. These were the following conditions laid by Father Pablo, which Rizal did not agree. First is that Rizal must publicly retract his errors concerning religion and make statements that were clearly pro-Spanish and against revolution. Second is that he must perform the church rites and make a general confession of his past life. And the third one is that henceforth Rizal must present in an exemplary manner a Spanish subject and a man of religion. Regardless of the situation, the relations of Captain Carcinero and the prisoner Rizal were warm and friendly. Captain Carcinero ga also gave Rizal a complete freedom to roam anywhere in the Pitan and moreover, he was also given a permission to ride his favorite horse because Rizal was an excellent equestrian after all. Now Rizal in return respected the generosity of the commandant and wrote a poem entitled Adon Ricardo Carcenero on August 26, 1892 as a gift to the captain's birthday. In the Pitan, Rizal had a scholarly debate with Father Pastels regarding religion. This exchange of heated arguments re revealed the anti-clerical Rizal his bitterness on the abuses performed by priors, doing such under the name of the pure religion. Father Pastels tried his best to win Rizal back to the faith, but apparently it was in vain. The series of debate ended inclusively in which neither of them convinced the other of his arguments. Though they both have religious differences, they still remain good friends. After that, Father Pastels gave Rizal a copy of a famous Catholic book by Father Thomas E. Kempis, entitled Imitation de Cristo or Imitation of Christ in English. Also, Rizal reciprocated by giving the, the Jesuit priest a bust of St. Paul which he had made. Now, although Rizal did not subscribe to Father Pastels' inter interpretation of church doctrine, he continued to be Catholic. He heard Mass at the Catholic Church of the Pitan and celebrated Christmas and other religious festivities accordingly. His Catholicism, though, was an inquisitive form of such sort, like he was seeking for profound and acceptable explanations. In July 1892, Rizal reached the Pitan as a prisoner. He found it as a sleepy little town but soon became awake. His stay improved his artistic and literary skills, doing agricultural and civic projects engaging in business activities, his careers and achievements in different fields. The first field is the architectural and engineering works. When Rizal obtained the title Verito Agrimensor from Ateneo Municipal, he already had practical knowledge in surveying. He widened his knowledge by reading engineering books. 
He successfully provided a sol sound water system in the province. He said to Father Pastils in his letter, I want to do all I can for this town. Rizal provided free medicine to his patients and most are under privilege. He had many he had wealthy patients like Don Ignacio who paid him 300 pesos for restoring his sight. An Englishman who gave him 500 pesos and Don Francisco Azcaraga, an Aklanon Hacendero who paid him a cargo of sugar. In August 1893, his skills was put to test when his mother, Doña Teodora Alonso, was placed under ophthalmic surgery for the third time. Together with his friend, Father Francisco Sanchez, he helped remake the plaza, which he jokingly said must rival the best in Europe. They made an excellent map of Mindanao, and they helped the citizens place lampposts at every corner of the Pitan's first lighting system. Rizal devoted his time in planting important crops and fruit-bearing trees in his 16 hectare land to 70 hectare later, which he was able to claim because of the lottery ticket that he had purchased and won him a prize of 6,200 pesos, and all of which he spent in the Pitan. He brought a land all along the bay and built himself, built himself a little house where he spent much time there. He imported agricultural machinery from the United States and introduced to the native farmers of the Pitan the modern agricultural methods. He tried his luck in the fishing, hemp, and copra industries but only in the hemp industry in which he became more successful. Rizal was interested in the languages used in the Pitan. He studied and made comparisons of the Visayan and Malayan languages ex existing in the region. Rizal knows 22 languages. These are the Tagalog, Ilocano, Visayan, Subanon, Spanish, Latin, Greek, English, French, German, Japanese, Portuguese, Swedish, and Russian. In 1892, only Rizal and his sister Lucia had gone left Hong Kong for Manila. In August 26, 1893, Trinidad and Doña Teodora left Hong Kong and proceeded to where Rizal was. Rizal wrote another poem and he sent the poem to his mother on October 22, 1895. The poem entitled Me Retero. Rizal established a school in Talisay near the Pitan, where he had his farm and hospital. Sixteen young boys from prominent families attended the class. Instead of charging them for the matriculation, he made he made the students do community projects for him, like, ma like maintaining his garden and field. He taught them reading, writing in English and Spanish, geography, history, mathematics, technical work, nature study, morals, and gymnastics. He encouraged his students to engage in sport activities to strengthen their bodies as well. There was no formal room, as the typical classroom nowadays. Classes will be conducted from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m., with the teachers sitting on a hammock while the students sat on a long bamboo bench. His favorite rendezvous with his boys was under Italy Sai tree, after which the place, in honor of Talisai, he wrote a poem entitled Hemno e Talisai for his pupils to sing. Rizal had always been missing his family and their happy moments together in Calamba, and his despair heightened upon hearing of Leonor Rivera's death. Soon after, to his surprise, an Irish girl lightened up his rather gloomy heart. This girl was the 18-year-old Josephine Bracken, slender, blonde, blue eyes, well-dressed, and of a light countenance. From Hong Kong, she arrived in the Pitan in February 1895 with his blind foster father named George Tuffer and a Filipina named Manuela Orlac, mistress of someone in the Manila Cathedral.
Rizal's fame as an ophthalmic surgeon reached overseas. And one of Rizal's friends, Julio Lorente, referred his group to Rizal. Rizal and Josephine instantly fell in love with each other, a relationship which Rizal's family was not pleased. Rizal had anticipated the anxious reaction of his family, and so he tried to bridge such gap between his relatives and Miss B, as he called her. In a, le in a letter dated March 14, 1895, he appealed to Doña Tudora. Please, according to Doña Tudora, please treat Josephine as a person whom I esteem and much appreciate, and I would not like to see exposed and abandoned. In one month's time, they agreed to marry, and when Mr. Tuffer sensed their developing a fear, he flared up in violent rage trying to commit suicide. But Rizal prevented him from killing himself. To avoid any tragedy, Josephine went away with Tuffer to Manila. The blind man sailed off uncured because his ailment was venereal, hence incurable. Mr. Tuffer returned alone in Hong Kong and Josephine stayed in Manila with Rizal's family. Later, she returned to the Pitan. However, the parish priest of the Pitan, Father Pedro Obak, refused to marry them unless Rizal retracted from religious error and returned to the Catholic Church. Since no priest was willing to marry the two, they decided to have a live-in relationship with in, which enraged the priest even more. In 1896, this bore its fruit. Josephine was pregnant. Unfortunately, like some accounts say as a, like some accounts say, as a result of some incident, incident, incidents that might have shocked or frightened. Bracken, she gave birth to a premature baby boy who lived only for three hours. The child was buried in the pitan, bearing the name Francisco after Rizal's father. After the outbreak of the revolution, the Katipunan leader Andres Bonifacio sought the advice of Rizal. In a secret meet meeting on May 2, 1896, at Bitukang Manok River in Pasig, the group agreed to send Pio Valenzuela as a representative to the Pitan who would inform Rizal of their plan to launch a revolution against the Spaniards. With a round-trip first-class ticket worth 60 pesos, Valenzuela went to the Pitan and used the name Procopio Bonifacio aboard the steamship Venus. He arrived at the Bay of the Pitan on June 21, 1896. Together with him in the ship were Josephine Bracken, Rizal's sister Narcisa, and Rizal's niece Angelica Lopez, Lopez from the ship. Valenzuela, together with two other companions, Raimondo Mata, a blind man, and Rufino Magos, an attendant, proceeded directly to the house of Rizal. At night, Rizal invited Valenzuela for dinner. After supper, they talked in the garden. There, Valenzuela told him of the Katipunan's plan. Regarding this, Rizal outspokenly objected Bonifacio's premature idea for two reasons. His first reason is the Filipino were still unprepared for such bloody revolution. And, the, and his second reason is that the Katipunan lacked machinery. Before plotting a revolution, there must be sufficient arms and funds collected.
Rizal also advised the Katipunan leaders to attract all wealthy and influential persons of Manila and the provinces to join the secret organization. To attract the rich, he suggested them to seek the help of Antonio Luna. Rizal believed that Luna would be very helpful in the revolution because he can direct the campaign in case of hostilities break out. Valenzuela, on the other hand, told Rizal of their plan to rescue him in the Pitan. Again, the exiled hero disagreed because he had no plan of breaking his word of honor to the Spanish authorities. So, Valenzuela went back to Manila without convincing Rizal. On December 6, 1896, the trial of Dr. Jose Rizal by a Spanish military court for sedition, rebellion, and conspiracy began. This leads to his execution and martyrdom. Rizal's warm friend, Dr. Blumen Tritt, wrote him from Bohemia about an epidemic of yellow fever in Cuba and the pathetic lack of doctors to attend the sick. Rizal kept asking Governor General Blanco for permission to go to Cuba. When he least expected it, the notice came that he was to become a volunteer physician in Cuba Government Hospital. He was again a free man, and again he was to become a wanderer. Jose Rizal left the Pitan on the midnight of July 31, 1896. The Hispana arrived in the Manila Bay early morning of August 6, 1896. Unfortunately, Rizal did not catch the mail boat of Spain. On September 3, 1896, Bearing letters of introduction from the Governor General to the Secretaries of War and Foreign Affairs in Spain, Jose Rizal departed for Barcelona on board the Isla de Panay. Fifteen days before his departure, the Katipunan was betrayed. On August 19, 1896, the Katipunan was discovered by Father Mariano Hill members and supposed member of the Katipunan were arrested and tortured until they revealed the names of other supposed members. At least there were 4,377 people arrested Bonifacio himself and most of the leaders escaped to safe hiding places. When Isla de Panay departed for Spain reach Singapore, Pedro Birujas, a Filipino fellow passenger, and Captain Camus, an agent of Tabac Lara, tried to persuade Rizal to stop ashore and save his life, but Rizal gave around no for an answer. The special military court summoned Rizal to appear before them when the Isla de Panay reached Suez. A cable awaited it, ordering the immediate arrest of Jose Rizal and his return to Manila for trial. On November 3, 1896, Rizal on board Cologne arrived in Manila. He was immediately transferred to Fort Santiago where he was imprisoned until his execution date 57 days later. In Fort Santiago, Rizal was not allowed to see his family and friends for several weeks. During these said weeks, Spaniards tried to build up charges against him. His brother Pashano and some Filipino patriots were violently tortured in order to gather evidences that they could use against him. On November 20, 1896, the investigation against Rizal started. He was subject to interrogation that lasted for five days. Investigation was headed by Judge Advocate Colonel Francisco Olive. He gave two kinds of evidences. First, the 15 documentary evidences and second is the 13 testimonial evidences. Let's discuss first the documentary evidences. So these are the documentary evidences given by Judge Advocate Colonel Francis. First, October 16, 1888 letter of Antonio Luna to Mariano Ponce, 
which implied that Rizal had something to do with the Filipino reform movement in Spain. Second, the August 20, 1890 letter of Rizal to his family in Calamba, which mentioned the deportations have a positive effect because Filipinos will be encouraged to hate Spaniards' cruel ways. Third, the January 7, 1889 letter of Marcelo H. Del Pilar to Diodato Arellano, showing Rizal's connection with the propaganda movement in Madrid. The poem Condiman, written on September 12, 1891, by Rizal, which mentioned that his beautiful country is bound in chains, is an oppressed slave of tyrants, and is longing for liberty. September 18, 1891, letter of Carlos Oliver to an unknown individual, which stated that Rizal will be the Philippine savior from the Spaniards' tyrannical rule. The February 9, 1892, Masonic document which glorified Rizal for his services to his beloved country. May 24, 1892, letter signed by Di Masala, which is Rizal's pen name, to Ten Luz, pen name of Juan Zulueta, which mentioned a refuge place for Filipinos oppressed by the Spaniards. The September 3, 1892 letter of Ildefonso Laurel to Rizal, stating that Rizal was considered by the Filipinos as their savior. September 17, 1892, letter of a certain Rizal Segundo to an unknown correspondent informing him of the arrest and exile of two Filipinos, which are Doroteo Cortez and Ambrosio Salvador. September, the June 1, 1893, letter of Marcelo H. Del Pilar to Don Juan Tenluz, Juan or Juan Zulueta, suggesting the formation of an organization free from masonry that could help the Filipino people. The transcript of speech of Pinkian, Emilio Jacinto, delivered in a reunion of Katipuneros, on July 22, 1893, which mentioned of subversive cries, Long live in the Philippines, long live liberty, long live Dr. Rizal, unity. A transcript of speech of Tic Tic, Jose Toriano Santiago, delivered in a reunion of Katiponeros on July 22, 1893, which also mentioned anti Spanish cries of the said group of people. Death to the oppressor nation, long live the eminent Dr. Rizal. And lastly, a poem written by La Umlaan, Rizal's another pen, pen name, with a title, Atalisay, wherein the students in the Pitan in the form of song chanted that they know how to fight for their rights. Those are the documentary evidences presented during the trial of Rizal. To complete the preliminary investigations, Colonel Olive submitted the said two types of evidences to Governor General Ramon Blanco. Captain Rafael Dominguez was appointed judge advocate by the Governor General. As the judge advocate, Captain Dominguez summarized the charges against Dr. Rizal and returned this to Governor General Blanco, who in turn submitted them to the office of the judge advocate General Don Nicolas de la Peña. The Judge Advocate General, after scrutinizing the documents, transmitted the following recommendations. First, Rizal accused must be subjected to trial at once. Number two, he must stay in prison while waiting trial. Third, an attachment order must be issued against his properties to the amount of 1 million pesos as a form of indemnity to the Spanish government. Fourth, an army officer, not civilian lawyer, must defend him in trial court. So from a list of army officers submitted to Dr. Jose Rizal, he chose Don Luis Taviel de Andrade, 
who is Don Luis Daniel de Andrade. He is the defender of reserve in court. Don Luis turns out to be the brother of Lieutenant Jose Tabiel de Andrade, his former bodyguard in Calamba in 1887. Having heard good stories about Rizal from his brother, Don Luis gladly accepted the assignment to defend him. On December 11, 1896, the charges brought up against Dr. Rizal were read to him. In the presence of his counsel, Don Luis Javier de Andrade. After hearing the said charges, Dr. Rizal made it clear that 1. He was not questioning the court's jurisdiction on his case. 2. Since his exile in the Pitan, he had not been involved in political activities. 3. He did not admit the charges against him. And lastly, he did not admit the, statement, the statements made against by the witnesses. The Trial at Court Martial Governor General Camilo G. de Pola Vieja, who replaced Governor General Blanco, received Rizal's case on December 13, 1896. He authorized the order to subject Dr. Rizal to trial by court martial on December 26, 1896, a day after Rizal's saddest Christmas Day, as he was all alone and in despair inside a prison cell in Fort Santiago. On December 26, 1896, at 8 o'clock in the morning, the court-martial trial of Rizal started in the Cortel de España, a military building. Rizal, wearing a black suit, white vest, and black tie, sat on a bench between the two soldiers. Like a common criminal, his arms were tied behind him. He maintained his composure and looked dignified. Rizal was accused of three crimes, first rebellion, second sedition, and third is illegal association. Attorney Enrique de Alucer, the prosecuting attorney, delivered a very long speech enumerating the charges against Rizal. He tried his very best to convince the members of the military court to give the death verdict to Rizal accused. Upon hearing Attorney Alazar's petition, the Spanish spectators noisily cheered and clapped their hands. The defense counsel, Luis Taviel de Andrade, came next after Attorney Alazar. He ended by reminding the judges to be just and avoid vindictiveness when making decisions. The court asked Rizal if he wanted to add other things to Lt. Tabiel de Andrade's defense of his case. Rizal answered in affirmative and had given supplementary defense to make the 12 statements. So Rizal made 12 st statements as his supplementary defense. So first, he cannot be accused of rebellion because he was not in favor of revolution. Second, he had not contact with the radical revolutionary groups. Third, his name was used by revolutionary elements without his permission. His very peaceful life in the Pitan where he built a house, a hospital, and bought lands were proofs of his non-involvement in revolutionary activities. He was not consulted by revolutionists when they started their uprising. He wrote La Liga Filipina. But he could not be accused of rebellion because this was just a civic organization. La Liga Filipina did not last long because he was already exiled in the Pitan. La Liga Filipina was recognized nine months after he was banished to the Pitan. The La Liga Filipina did not serve purpose of the rebels, otherwise this could have taken the place of the Katipunan. If he wrote bitter comments on his letters, these were written in 1890 when his family was dispossessed of their lands and his brother-in-laws 
were deported and exiled. His exemplary life in the Pitan was witnessed by Spanish political military commanders and missionary priests and they could attest to it. And lastly, he denied that his speech at the house of Doroteo on Hong Kong inspired the revolution, as alleged by some witnesses. But with these statements, the military court remained indifferent. So Lieutenant Colonel Pogores Arjona, the president of the military court, closed the trial and ordered the clearing of the court hall. After a short deliberation, the seven members of the military court voted unanimously for the death sentence of Dr. Jose Rizal. Same day, December 26, 1896, the said decision of the court was transmitted to Governor General Polavieja, who in turn consulted Judge Advocate General Nicolas de la Peña regarding their decision. He affirmed the death sentence. Governor General Paula Vieja approved the decision of the court martial and ordered the execution of the death verdict on Rizal on December 30, 1896, at Bagumbayan Field, now known as Loneta. He was sentenced to be shot in musketry until death at 7 o'clock in the morning of December 30, 1896. By 6.30 a.m., Rizal marched to Bagumbayan. He in his black suit, black necktie, black hat, black shoes, and white vest. Rizal refused to be blindfolded and insisting to face his executioners. But this was denied Rizal was willing to show that he was no traitor and that he is ready to die for his country. Now, what is the impact of a result's life and execution to the present governmental system in the Philippines? The life and execution of a Rizal has a big impact to the present governmental system in the Philippines where people have the privilege to fight for their right and most of all, free from colonizers. And we are now in a state of democratic place where everyone's perspective are respected.